Hi guys, welcome back to Railways Explained. Today's episode will be a part of our Railway Nation series, and we'll talk about United States Railroads. What? Yes, you heard right, Railway Nation and the United States. To date, we made several videos relating to the American Railway topics, but this one will be an attempt to summarize all important aspects about this gigantic railway system. Also, we will briefly update previous videos with some novelties and recent activities from the field. For all of you who are new on Railways Explained, we will put the links of those videos in the description of this video. Don't forget to check them out. Now, in accordance with the two old Latin sayings, Historia Magistra Vitae Est and Repetitio Est Mater Studiorum, a short history lesson. As you might know, we already covered the history of the American Railways in a special video which we recommend you watch. You should do it in case you want to understand the background that led to the present condition of the American Railways. Here we will stick only to the aspects most relevant for the story, starting from the 1960s. With the growing competitiveness of road transport, primarily due to construction of the federal highway system and the development of national airlines during the 1960s and 1970s, railroad companies that were privately owned were knocked out. Passengers abandoned the rail service, and with the construction of highways, the trucking industry grew, which easily beat the railroads in the market race. In addition to all these problems, railroad companies also had to deal with the government's regulatory body, which had the power to determine maximum reasonable rail rates. This made railroads inefficient as they could not price according to demand. There were many regulations and processes that hindered attempts to change rail pricing. Due to this situation, there was a bankruptcy of large rail companies, most notably Penn Central Transportation Company in 1971. Back then, it was the largest bankruptcy in the nation's history. That is why the federal government intervened to prevent further similar events. Congress first addressed the passenger train problem. Namely, in 1970, the Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act, which created Amtrak. Subsequently, the Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act in 1976 and the famous Staggers Rail Act in 1980 were adopted. The impact of Staggers Act was incredible as it allowed railroads to compete on the free market. This caused productivity to increase and in turn prices to fall. The result of deregulation was a leaner, profitable US rail industry. As you can see, it has grown productivity and volumes of transportation, caused rates to decrease, and, what is interesting, resulted in a growth of income, but only after a long period of time. For many years, railroads have been merging in order to increase efficiency and develop financially stable rail businesses large enough to compete with other modes of transportation, mostly trucks and barges. Following the passage of the Staggers Rail Act in 1980, the pace of merger activity increased. Railroads strove to reduce costs, increase efficiency and increase the area they served, while eliminating unnecessary lines and enhancing their market power. Also, the Staggers Act impacted on the creation of short-line railroads, which formed to operate lines that major railroads abandoned or sold off. The Surface Transportation Board, an independent federal agency that oversees the economic regulation of freight railroads, and deals with issues related to railroad rates and rail service, for regulatory purposes categorized rail carriers into three classes, Class 1, Class 2 and Class 3. The classes are based on the carrier's annual operating revenue. Current thresholds establish Class 1 carriers as any carrier earning revenue greater than $900 million. Class 2 carriers as those earning between $40.4 million and $900 million and Class 3 carriers as those earning less than $40.4 million. According to the Association of American Railroads, there are a total of 632 rail companies in the United States, seven of which are Class 1 that include BNSF, CSX, Kansas City Southern, Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, Canadian National and Canadian Pacific Railway. The seven private Class 1 railroads are the largest railway carriers and account for the majority of the railway infrastructure in the country. As in America, infrastructure management and transportation are not separated, these companies operate over 92,000 route miles, across 46 states and account for around 88% of employees and 94% of revenue. 
Regional and short lines carriers operate over approximately 45,000 route miles in 49 states. For large areas of the country, and particularly for small town rural America, short line rail service connects farmers and businesses to the National Railroad Network. On the screen, you can see the first 10 states in the United States according to the length of the rail route miles. According to the AAR, overall, the busiest place for railroads in the nation is Chicago, and its status has held for 125 years. Daily, nearly 500 freight trains and 760 passenger trains operate through the region. About 25% of all U.S. freight rail traffic and 46% of all intermodal traffic begins, ends or travels through the Chicago region. We need to say that freight railroads overwhelmingly own, build, maintain, operate and pay for their infrastructure with no too little government assistance. Class 1 railroads spend approximately $25 billion a year on capital expenditures and maintenance expenses. Include locomotives, freight cars, tracks, bridges, tunnels and other infrastructure, equipment and technology. On average, freight railroads spend six times more on capital expenditures as a percentage of revenue than the US average manufacturer. If you look at the land transport market measured in the US ton miles of freight, the railroads participate with 41% according to data for 2018. Truly speaking, this is the dream of all policymakers in the European Union where the share of rail freight transport measured in ton kilometers stagnates at around 18% in last decade. In the same period, the road model share increased to over 75%. If you look at the average for the last five years, the US railroads have generated over 2 trillion ton miles each year. When you look at the difference between operating revenues and expenditures, you get unbelievable figures for us from Europe. And yes, these numbers are measured in billions. Do you know that electrified rail is currently used on less than 1% of US railroad tracks, while worldwide electricity supplies more than one third of all trains? Accordingly, the figure on screen shows how much Class 1 freight railroads consumes fuel measured in million gallons. That is, on average, 13.4 billion liters of diesel every year. While this is certainly a big blow to the environment, we must point out that if railroads did not move freight in the United States, it would take over 99 million additional trucks traveling on public roads, and would take four times more fuel to handle the freight Americans rely on every day. According to EPA data, freight railroads account for just 0.5% of total US greenhouse gas emissions, and just 1.9% of transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. AAR analysis of federal data also finds the following. Moving more freight by rail instead of road would spur even greater GHG reductions. If 25% of the truck traffic moving at a distance of at least 750 miles went by railroad instead, annual greenhouse gas emissions would fall by approximately 13.1 million tons. If 50% of the truck traffic moving at least 750 miles went by rail instead, greenhouse gas emissions would fall by approximately 26.2 million tons. Three types of rail systems operate on the National Rail Network of the United States – freight, intercity passenger and commuter transport. Commuter rail is a form of passenger rail service that traditionally operates within a metropolitan area. It connects suburban or commuter towns with a central city, but today we'll focus exclusively on hard railways, freight and intercity. National Railroad Passenger Corporation, or Amtrak, operates passenger trains across a national system consisting of three service lines – Northeast Corridor, Long Distance and State Supported Services. Amtrak trains are serving more than 500 destinations in 46 states on more than 21,400 miles. Amtrak owns approximately 655 miles of lines, primarily in the Northeast and Michigan. Some of the remaining tracks are owned by states or regional transport authorities, but the vast majority are owned by freight railroads. In 2019, about 70% of the total train miles operated by Amtrak are achieved on tracks owned by other railroads, also called the host railroads. On the screen, you can see the six largest host railroads for Amtrak, among which BNSF, Union Pacific and CSX Transportation dominate. 
The busiest station in terms of passenger numbers in 2019 was the famous Penn Station in New York, with almost 11 million passengers or over 30,000 passengers a day. In 2020, due to the situation with the COVID pandemic, that number is almost halved, as you can see on the screen. In the following part of the video, we will stick to the data for 2019 in order to show the real contribution of the railroad system to the transport of passengers in the United States. Amtrak is the only high-speed intercity passenger rail provider, operating at speeds up to 150 miles per hour along the NEC corridor. Railways Explained made a special video on this topic where we discussed whether the Acela high-speed rail service complies with the existing high-speed requirements in both the United States and other parts of the world. We also explained all about the introduction of the new Avelia Liberty train sets. If you have not watched this video, in the description will be a link. Also, nearly half of all trains operate at the top speeds of 100 miles per hour or more. During 2019, the Amtrak ridership totaled a record of 32.5 million trips. On an average day, customers made nearly 89,100 trips on more than 300 Amtrak trains. Amtrak carried more than three times as many riders between Washington DC and New York City as all of the airlines combined. As for the state-supported services, Amtrak receives funding from 17 states through 20 agencies for financial support of 28 short-distance routes that are less than 750 miles. Five services with over 500,000 passengers for 2019 are shown on the screen. Busiest service is the Hiawatha service that is an 86-mile train route on the western shore of Lake Michigan between Chicago, Illinois and Milwaukee. According to the available punctuality data, you can see on the screen the percentage of trains that arrived on time. As you can see, long-distance service is the least reliable where only about 50% of trains arrive on time. But what does on-time mean in the Amtrak case? Amtrak trains are considered on-time if the arrival at the end point is within the minutes of scheduled time as shown in the table. Trip length is based on the total distance traveled by that train from origin to destination. According to data for 2019, Amtrak recovered 99.1% of operating costs with ticket sales, payments from state partners and agencies, and other operating revenue. In addition to Amtrak, there is also Brightline. Brightline represents privately owned intercity rail service in the United States. In the perspective, it will include two routes branded as Brightline East in Florida and Brightline West in Las Vegas and Southern California. Currently, part of Brightline East from Miami to West Palm Beach in Florida is in operation and the rest of Brightline is under construction or its construction has yet to begin. We also made a comprehensive video about this, which we published in March 2021, whose link will also be in the description. A speed of 79 miles per hour allows Brightline trains to travel between Miami and West Palm Beach in 1 hour and 13 minutes, while cars on this route take about 1 hour and 6 minutes, if there is no traffic jam. Ridership for 2018 was 579,000 passengers and for 2019 it was around 885,000. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic disrupted and ended this service, bearing in mind that Brightline suspended operations on March 25, 2020 with the relaunch on November 8, 2021. Regarding the extension of this route to Orlando, which we mentioned in our last year's video, we pointed out that the service will be released during 2022. However, according to latest information, passengers can expect rail service between South Florida and Orlando not before early 2023. We have come to the part where we talk about the American dream, which is the introduction of high-speed rail systems in the United States. There are currently several initiatives in the United States, each at a different stage of implementation, and for each we have released an in-depth video so far. However, let's now summarize. Let's start with the California High-Speed Rail Project. This project is divided into two phases. Phase 1 of the High-Speed Rail System refers to the 520-mile section San Francisco Merced Los Angeles Anaheim. Phase 2 refers to the future program extensions from Merced to Sacramento and from Los Angeles to San Diego via the Inland Empire, in length of 280 miles. In relation to the deadlines that we discussed in the video, we can say that according to the available data, there were no changes, i.e. the deadline for the completion of the first phase is 2023, with the assumption that project authorities will overcome funding and routing challenges. 
As for the overall cost estimate for phase 1, it rose from 80 billion euro of expenditure dollars to a maximum of 88 billion euro of expenditure dollars. The next initiative that is physically connected to the California high speed rail in the city of Palmdale is Brightline West. This project, with a total length of 260 miles, aims to link Las Vegas and Los Angeles via Palmdale on one side and through Cajon Pass on the other. According to the data we presented at the time, the beginning of the works was planned for the second quarter of 2021, but the works have not started yet. Currently, the Federal Railroad Administration is reviewing compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act and related environmental permitting and plans to complete it by November 2022. This will allow Brightline to finally begin construction of the project in early 2023 with the aim of launching passenger service in 2026. If the Brightline West project receives final federal approval, the Miami-based company could apply for potential low-interest funding options for high-speed rail included in the recently approved U.S. infrastructure program. But we need to add that details of the types of federal support for private rail projects haven't yet been released. In August 2021, we covered a topic related to the Dallas-Houston Bullet Train project, which includes the construction of a double-track railway in a length of 240 miles with the utilization of the Shinkansen technology. This high-speed rail project has been wired by setbacks and controversy for the better part of a decade. Many questions still remain open, such as the project's financial viability and whether Texas Central has the legal authority to exercise an eminent domain to acquire the land needed to construct a railway between Texas' two largest cities. Video on the construction of a superconducting maglev system between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. on a grade-separated fixed guideway powered by magnetic forces was published in October 2021. The status of the project remains the same, as FRA has paused environmental review and permitting status. So, we have reached the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your rail-loving friends, and of course, subscribe to our channel. If you want to go further and want to help us improve our production, visit our Patreon page and consider becoming our patron. Until the next time, goodbye.